Wonderful. Okay, so it's 7.05 in Japan, 11.05 in Central Europe, and 7.05 in the Americas. We will start our panel discussion. Good morning to our attendees from Europe and the Americas. Good afternoon to everyone in the Asia Pacific countries. Thank you everyone for coming to this session. I'm very happy that the technology is allowing us to truly connect on a worldwide scale and now more than ever. So first, I hope you are all safe and well from wherever you're joining us. I'm Daniel and I'm the student board representative uh, from Chile, from South America, and I'll be moderating today this panel discussion regarding challenges in the Asia Pacific countries with three wonderful and amazing SEMS alumni currently located in Malaysia, Singapore, and Australia. So let me start by thanking the team that made all this possible. It has been a gigantic effort from Global Office in cooperation with the student board to coordinate and deliver this panel among all other webinars during this virtual career fair for the APEC countries. So big shout out to all of them. And thank you as well very much to Anna, Shreya and Julian here joining us and collaborating with us. On behalf of all students, I thank you one of you for giving part of your valuable time to answer all of our questions. Uh, I think this might be a very interesting space uh, to see and to talk a little bit about Asia and how it is to start the career in Asia. So warm welcome to Anna, Shreya and Julian. Anna is joining us from Singapore, Shreya is joining us from Malaysia and Julian from Australia. So why don't we start and I would kindly introduce ask each one of you to introduce yourself and maybe mention a little bit uh, your main key points from your professional career so far. So Anna, why don't we start with you? And I think it's important that you unmute yourself, please. <laughs> Otherwise we won't, yeah, go burn. <laughs> good, 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 fine. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so I'll, for, for organizing this uh, fair and for Sims for making this uh, um, happen in this difficult time. Uh, a little bit about myself. I graduated from SEMS in 2016. Uh, my home university was the Na was National University of Singapore. Um, I'm originally from Armenia and I spent uh, two, two of my ex exchange semesters at Estada Business School and the University of Sydney. Um, so throughout my entire career, that is before and after SEMS, I've always worked with alongside uh, um, sales and business development with companies of different sizes. Um, so startups and MNCs. And I've helped uh, in my, primarily in, in, in my professional career, I've helped companies grow by being on the ground, working directly with the customers. Um, also supporting the company by b enabling them um, to build um, successful teams to support the growth of the company um, and working alongside with founders um, when I was working in for, for small startups um, to create strategies that will support them to grow uh, internationally. Um, so that's, that's, these are the highlights of probably my career, but if you have any specific questions, I'm happy to answer. Wonderful, thank you, Anna. For everyone, uh, we will have our first Q&A round, so start dropping your question on the Q&A box. Shreya, can you continue? Yes, of course. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for inviting us to this panel discussion, Daniel and the entire team. Um, hi guys, I am Shreya. I am from India and I'm currently working in Malaysia at this point. So a very bit brief about me is that I graduated in 2017 from HKUST in Hong Kong, did my exchange SEM in Canada. So quite a variety of cultures right there. But um, over, so to give you a brief of my background, right, I've been working in the digital industry in APAC for the past two and a half years. However, that is not how I started. So if I kind of just recap and rewind um, from the starting of my career, I worked in India previously in the financial services sector. And funnily enough, I started working in uh, a global MNC that was like for the first two years of my career and fast forward post sense. I don't know what happened over there, but then I ended up joining uh, the startup ecosystem. And it's been a very, very interesting transformation as well as very intriguing in terms of understanding the culture of MNC versus startups, as well as I've worked entirely in my entire career has been in APAC. So in case you have any questions for APAC, Malaysia or India, feel free to direct it towards me and let me know how I can help. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Shreya, so much. 
Julian, why don't we go with you in Australia? Sure, thanks, Daniel. Um, pleasure to be here too. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Julian. I was born in Germany, um, did my undergrads in Germany and the US, and then um, had a bit of um, exposure to different industries with internships in consulting, investment banking, diplomacy, startup, um, and so on, and then decided um, that, that I wanted to continue my studies in Barcelona. So that, that was my Sam's Home University, where I started in 2012 and um, went to Australia, um, Sydney, um, Sydney University for my SEMS exchange. Graduated, went back to Barcelona, um, did a master of research and then started working in strategy consulting in Germany um, and then continued doing so here in, in Australia. Um, have been doing that for the past five years and I started my PhD mid last year. So don't be confused about the PhD and my name. I wish I was done, but still two to three years to go. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Julian. As you see, everyone, we have here a very, very different kind of profiles. We have people from Singapore, Malaysia, Australia, but also all of them have lived in different countries as well. So it's very interesting for this panel to see uh, how they develop their careers and how they ended in Asia. But before we jump into the panel, it's very important that we start with some very key figures about the APEC region. Uh, it's a region that currently is facing some troubles and challenges as well as the entire world. But it's very interesting to note that uh, Asia is currently driven by China and India. So Asia's developing economies saw healthy rates of growth uh, during the 2019. Obviously, this is everything um, with like the, the unupdated with our current global situation. Japan's economy prospects are less favorable, favorable however, and growth in the Asia Pacific region in terms of real GDP is expected to be 4.8% in 2020. So it's a very, very okay rate in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the global, global glo growth. Uh, Beijing's managed the deceleration of the economy continues in global uncertainties and India can claim to be the world's fastest growing major economy. Having that in mind, there are some key very interesting notes uh, and figures we can jump into the discussion. And I will let you all know that please start dropping all your questions in the question Q&A box down below. Feel free to direct the question and address the question to each of our panelists here pre present. Anna, why don't we start with you? <laughs> you have over five years of experience in international business building and your speci specialities are B2B sales. You have been partner, uh, in your current job, sorry, you're on a mission to, to make a higher education accessible for 100 million students by 2025. So that's, that seems to be very interesting, but very challenging as well. So what, what, have, what are the main challenges you have found so far pursuing this mission? And which of the one of those are related to APEC countries and APEC realities? That's a very, very good question. And in fact, in my current role, I get to work with uh, lots all of the countries in APEC. So you, I, I work with um, um, schools in Korea, in Japan, which are more developed countries in APAC, but also uh, countries like, you know, Myanmar that is just starting to open up and growing. Uh, countries like Indonesia that has infrastructure issues and doing business in all, all these countries is very different because you get to have, uh, when you look at the Asia Pacific market, you will see that uh, there's just no country or market that is the same. So you have to be, um, careful of that when you, you're looking to, to, to work in Asia, right? So you have, um, these countries have different infrastructures, different levels of development. You have language barriers because not everyone speaks English and the, the, the same language is not used in all the other countries. Uh, regulations, um, very, very different buyer profiles or what they're looking to adopt. Um, so th these are some, some of the main challenges that you can see in APAC, right? Um, from my um, from my experience and my current company, some of the challenges that we face is mostly about um, how the digi digitization and access to internet computers 
um, that's the biggest challenge that we face because not all countries that we work with and not everyone has access to uh, computers or, or internet or even if they have access to that they're not the di um, digital how do I say it this word they're not digital native um, right so they they are having trouble for example to use tools like zoom that we're using today to be able to meet us online so we um, we in imagine like in a day if um, in a if in a virtual situation we could meet for example four or five schools at a time um, on an uh, if uh, in, with, given these challenges, we have to visit them individually. So we can meet only one one school in a day, and we'll in addition to uh, the travel time, uh, but we'll also spend a lot more money if we um, uh, are just visiting the schools and converting them into paying customers. So these are just some of the challenges that we face. Uh, of course, we have different ways of addressing that. Um, uh and how we educate the market but i think uh, i would also like to hear more about um how shreya and julian um if they have similar issues and how they um, um uh, tackle that wonderful thank you anna um shreya you started your career uh with a top tier multinational investment bank so it's completely different <laughs> and over the last two years you have been working in the e-commerce industry uh, in one of the fastest growing Southeast Asian markets. Um, and according to the international EMF in their regional economic outlook 2018, uh, they said that Asia is at the forefront of digitalization and workers are worried that robots will make them obsolete. At the same time, digitalization may well be a key driver of pro productivity growth and improve welfare over the long run. So, Shreya, my question to you uh, is what are the main opportunities you see for the next five years in the Asia Pacific region? And what are your thoughts regarding this point since you are currently working in the e-commerce industry? Right, absolutely. Um, uh, thanks, Daniel. Actually, um, that is a very interesting question more because I think it ties into a bit of what Anna also spoke about and it touches upon the challenges that Southeast Asia and Asia as a whole is facing at this point. So from challenges actually come even more opportunities, which we're actually seeing happen in Southeast Asia, especially. So to start off with, right, in APAC right now, even based on recent studies, it's known to be that APAC is actually going to contribute about majority, uh, it's going to contribute majority of the new members of the middle class society in the global economy. So what we can see in APAC right now is that there's a rising level of per capita income in each of the countries, as well as there's a rising level of middle class people that are emerging over the past years and the upcoming years. What happens as a part of this is, of course, there's GDP growth, but along with that comes a lot of the challenges that Anna also touched upon. So um, Asia, APAC as a whole, if I, if I break it down, right, because I've been working with a lot of e-commerce companies very closely, and while I'm stationed in Malaysia, I work with e-commerce companies all across Southeast at this point. So a lot of the challenges they face are similar to what Anna was also talking about in terms of logistics issue, poor infrastructure. Um, a lot of the e-commerce companies don't have access to users that are in tier two and tier three cities in um, the economies in Southeast. For instance, Indonesia. Indonesia itself seems like one country, but as, if you kind of break it down, it has so many different cities, so much of diverse customer behavior that one e-commerce company or one merchant itself cannot really dominate the market and cannot have access to the rural population and the segment which actually is looking to access e-commerce at this point. So with these challenges that we face and with, with such a fragmented market, right? Because APAC doesn't only uh, constitute of emerging economies like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, all the ones which are upcoming superpowers in a way, but also developed economies like your know, Japan, Singapore, and Korea. So in this kind of a fragmented market, there are so many opportunities that are coming about now, especially when it comes to digitalization. Few of them are what we've noticed is that for instance, um, there's an, uh, um, an opportunity for businesses, right? So now with digitalization, like we said, the challenge is tier two, tier three access, right? So with digitalization, what companies are more focused on is how to access them, how to break these barriers, how to build localized strategies so that they can actually reach to these consumer segments 
that have previously not shopped online or are, into, are, are not even aware of e-commerce in the first place. So it's a lot about education, awareness, and reaching out. As a part of this, what happens is that there are a lot of small businesses which previously haven't been exposed to the global market. And digitalization eventually will give the opportunity for these businesses to be in the global forefront. So eventually, it's a win-win because the economy is going to develop, right? Um, aside from that, if you look at a consumer perspective, so when a lot of these companies are coming to the global forefront, for instance, right, then it's a lot more demand in the market, a lot more product offerings, and a lot more connectivity. So Southeast Asia is so complex a market, which I have learned in the past two years, and I still have so much more to understand about it, is that because of this language barrier, there is so much difference in the customer mindset itself that connectivity, mobility, and social networks becomes increasingly important. Because so, so like, and I would love to hear Julian and Anna's perspective on this, but what I've understood of Southeast and APAC is that community is of incredible importance over here. So, I mean, with, with the presence of digitalization, it builds in a stronger community and connectivity. So that's another opportunity for consumers. Um, from a government perspective, digitalization can also help in developing the public infrastructure. Right now, Singapore, other countries, we all are looking at building smart cities, helping in um, getting more technology in, so for more market innovations. Like, so earlier, previously, if you rewind three years, four years ago, people wouldn't have heard as much about IoT, FinTech solutions, and digital banking as much as they're hearing right now. So it's, it might be very funny to hear when you're coming from markets like US and Europe, which are already at that point where it's established. But in APAC right now, all of this is being introduced and still at its nascent stage. So in terms of opportunities, I think digitalization eventually will bring a huge growth in the economy. At the same time, like you mentioned, I know a lot of uh, workers and labor forces fear unemployment. Um, it may happen and it is bound to happen in certain sectors. But be it manufacturing, be it um, your transport, be it storage and all these different industries, it might happen due to automation. However, it also brings in opportunities for new roles, new, op uh, new verticals, new industries to grow. So I think it's all about um, not elimination of jobs, but more about substitution, in which the current workers and the current laborers will have to reskill themselves and the government will have to maybe provide more initiatives for this to happen. So I think at the end, digitalization is definitely at a very initial stage in APAC and there's so much more to happen. Wonderful, thank you Shreya. And as you said, and I think it's a very interesting point, um, digitalization, digitalization of course comes with a, a huge growth alongside, but it's very interesting to discuss the two sides of the same coin because how can we actually provide or have this uh, growth uh, in a sustainable way, right? It's very also like a very interesting discussion to, to understand if this growth can be sustainable over time. And so we have a receiver, one of the question, I'm gonna address it to Julian. Julian, um, based on your experience, and maybe you can mm -hmm. chuckle down uh, and also explain a little bit on what you have worked so far, but mm -hmm. have businesses in APAC started to adapt to climate change do you see it in your work environment or with your clients as a consultant? How do you see, of course, digital, digitalization comes with a lot of opportunities, but also with some challenges. So what's your point uh, on, on, on this topic? Sure. So um, it's um, yeah, interesting when you address um, issues like climate change and so on, because I think one has to differentiate there all the different countries um, that belong to the APEC region. I think um, China, for example, and some other countries like Singapore have been um, forerunners in that space, um, given that they can um, obtain a competitive advantage um, in the case of Singapore or because it's such a massive country um, such as China. And in order to be able to grow to levels, you know, where it wants to be grown towards, um, it has to make use of uh, more natural resources. If you then talk about Australia, um, by landmass, a massive country, but by, um, by population size, um, quite uh, minimal, like a big Chinese city, I'd say. Um, there historically used to be a very different attitude if it comes to climate change and so on which um, I think Australia, you know, should have never been proud of because it was not 
pushing um, the climate change agenda much in the past years, but that's always a political question in Australia as well, because there have been um, social democratic slash labor governments, which, which introduced um, some, some climate change measures, but they were then abolished by the conservative slash liberal government. And then with the bushfire crisis that you probably have all been aware of, I think um, a change in perception has slowly started in society. Um, so that's good news on the climate change awareness, but what that leads to in terms of actions is a different story. And then if it comes to digitization, I would see Australia rather on the forefront of, uh, of that if it comes to usage. Um, I, I know and I have come across that in, um, in consulting as well as that companies um, have been trying out different products here, which they then can, you know, introduce in other Western markets. Um, comparing that with other countries in APAC, um, I mean, there are definitely countries which are more advanced in terms of their use of technology, such as South Korea, Japan, Singapore, again, or, or even China. So um, again, I don't think that Australia would be a role model there. Um, it would be a role model if you compare it with other developed other Western countries, I would say, comparing it with my experience in, um, in, in European countries, if it comes to the public sector, for example, and their adapt adaption of, um, you know, technology. For example, here in Australia, you, you can do your tax re return on your cell phone. You, you can do a lot of public services on your cell phone. And that's actually something where consulting businesses um, have also... Um, you know, been participating because they have been supporting the public sector with massive consulting projects, um, major implementation um, streams of, of those technologies. So it's an interesting space, but I wouldn't see Australia any, any different there than other parts of the de um, developed world. And Asia, I would think, has, um, is probably jumping in parts of it from you know, pre-industrialization to a post-modernist, like technology-driven um, part of the world. So, so it's definitely exciting. Wonderful, thank you. And um, I wanted to ask you as well, because you have lived in, in very different countries, in Spain, in Germany, in the UK, uh, in Dubai. What are the main differences you have noticed so far in, like, in a short answer uh, between working in the APEC countries and in European countries, for example, or even in, middle, in, middle, in the Middle East, I think most of the students here are, might or might be interested in working uh, in, in Asian and APEC countries. So what uh, would be like the three or the main differences you have noticed so far? Sure. Again, I think it very much depends on the location that you're talking about. Australia would be um, a country with quite a laid back culture, which you also see in the work environment. Interestingly enough, if you look at OCD statistics, it's one of the countries with the highest number of work hours per person. So yes, people are relaxed, but they do work long hours. Nothing in comparison to other Asian countries though. Um, what people um, tend to say here is that especially if you talk about Australians you know who've been born and raised here they would probably go to London, New York, LA, Hong Kong, Singapore to boost their career because again it's a very small market in Australia so probably not representative of what else you could achieve in Asia um, but then you may come back at a later stage in life when you want to have a family and so on because overall you know it's a great combination of um, uh, quality of life and standard of living which you know would also be seen in, in the labor market and and uh, the the work culture. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Um, on the same line, we have here one question to Anna, and it says, so "What would you recommend to a student to get well integrated in the Singap Singaporean society?" So, like in a very practical way, and we're shifting the conversation to a whole other level. But I think it's also very interesting for for us as students to, to get to know the practical uh, issues and maybe challenges that you have encountered uh, working in Singapore? Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, I would want to know a bit more about the student, whether they are studying at uh, one of the local universities, because uh, that was my experience when I first came to Singapore. I was studying at NUS and NUS had a really good, good 
opportunities that provided um, for open to all the students to be able to uh, kind of integrate with the, the local society. Um, in my SEMS, um, SEMS um, program, we only had um, a, a few handful of uh, uh, Singaporeans that were a part of the program, but our university provided some opportunities uh, as some events that uh, we could attend and uh, communicate with, with the locals. And, and Singapore being a transient place, I would recommend everyone to, to be friends with the local, make friends with the locals because uh, you will see that your, most of your friends come and go every, every other year. Um, and it's also very difficult. It, it, it's very easy to get into that, you know, um, flow where you meet uh, people from all, all, all over the world and uh, they, they leave and then um, during their farewell parties, you, you meet in the, another set of other people. So working with um, Singaporeans uh, ha has been, it, it was challenging when I first started because of the cultural differences, because the way you communicate certain things is not accepted. Uh, or for example, um, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> for example, um, the way I communicate uh, is very, I'm very direct. I, I say everything that um, the way I think it is. However, in Asian cultures, it's um, probably not perceived so, so well. So I would, oh, for my manager, I would hear that, you know, you should work on your, the way you communicate things because uh, uh, people like when you're not saying the obvious, but you're saying it in a, uh, like a milder way, uh, not to offend anyone. So it's again, uh, of course, it's the, based on like, you know, high context and low context cultures. If you if you guys have time to read on that, uh, you'll understand how the communication works and how, how different it is in different countries. But overall, Singaporeans are very friendly um, uh, and um, very easy to, to be friends with. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much. And on the same, kind of line of discussion. We have here a question for Shreya. And Shreya, the question says, this uh, person is wondering if you start working in India and then you apply for a transfer abroad to Malaysia or how did you manage to do it with, uh, with multiple countries? If you have like an Indian passport, I mean, of course, visas are always a topic for, for SEM students, I think. <laughs> so if you can, maybe further develop the, on that and maybe give some hints and advices to, to anyone thinking on uh, pursuing a career in Malaysia and in other countries. Sure, absolutely. So um, to answer that, um, no, I did not get any kind of internal transfer or, or, or work in India and get maybe a transition to Malaysia. But what did happen, interestingly enough, is I got to Malaysia because of a SEMS connection. So um, after my SEMS, after completing my SEM studies, what happened was I was searching for an internship as a part of the SEMS mandatory internships you have to do as part of the course. So as a part of that, I had, a, I had a friend who was working in a company in Malaysia who funnily enough was also started by SEMS itself. So once I got in touch with the person and understood the role and the industry, um, I'll be very honest that in Malaysia, it is not very difficult if you have the skill set, if you have the experience, or if you have a SEMS connection, to be very honest, and you have someone, it's like it's like you kind of belong to the same community or someone has more trust in you because they know the kind of background you're coming from, then if it's any of these factors, then it's rather easy or not so difficult or much of a challenge to get a visa, a work visa in Malaysia. So um, I previously never had any kind of digital experience, but I did have other kind of experiences and they thought that the skill set could maybe help in the current industry. So I think um, it would really help if you could maybe just actually leverage your sense connections in any kind of country you want to go to, or, or um, just look at the kind of company it is or the industry it is. Because in e-commerce, to be honest, there are a lot of expats. There are a lot of people coming from Europe, other parts of Asia into Malaysia at this point. It's, it's very diverse in terms of the employees. So, and in terms of your peers. So I think from that perspective, it's not difficult to actually get a work visa if you build your connection in the company. Wonderful, thank you, Shreya. Um, currently, we're facing some, some difficult times that, that uh, with measures like protectionism and a lot of impact of cross-border policies changes uh, and geopolitical instability. And that's not only in, the, in Asia and the Asia Pacific countries, but as well on a worldwide scale. 
these are drivers for more and more uncertainty and that affects of course business and uh, business as usual so my question to all of you three is from your own perspectives countries and industries where you're working at how do you think this might affect uh, future graduates uh, in APA countries uh, for the upcoming years? And what opportunities do you see in the next five years for APA markets? And um, maybe Julian, you can start um, giving your perspective from, from the consulting side and, and from your current job. Sure, um, so consulting um, obviously is a very volatile market, I would say. Um, if it comes to graduates, I don't really think um, that there would have been an effect of protectionism um, in the Australian market. Um, there has always been some level of protectionism, but I don't think that that would trickle through to um, consulting and, and graduates there. If I think about, you know, the current um, outbreak of, um, you know, coronavirus and so on, I mean, obviously that's... Um, and I was just scrolling through the news before the panel discussion. It's um, absolutely insane. And I, I, I would be the wrong person to, to uh, be asked what the consequences are. Um, I know that um, a friend of mine who is a um, partner in a law firm, which is a similar structure to a consulting firm, um, the entire partnership um, won't get any salary for the next three months and then maybe they have to settle on 50% less. And that is quite shocking. And if you think what impact that would have on, um, you know, on hiring and so on. And again, I don't want to, um, I don't want to perceive the situation is too bad, but I, I read some statistics today that the unemployment rate in Australia will probably increase by 40% up to October of this year. And I mean, this is just a, the beginning, um, if, and only if the, you know, the current situation um, continues to be as dire as it is. In China, you saw that there was a lockdown for a good month, a month and a half maybe, but then, you know, things now seem to be falling back into place. Um, so again, that may be then a very different situation. I, I really don't know. And it's a bit of a perspective of day by day. Um, it does seem to be worse than the GFC and that had impacted on, uh, you know, ha has had an impact, negative impact on, on graduates as well. I would not, um, my, my advice would be though, not to be afraid because in every of those situations, there is an opportunity. And for people out there who are currently looking to find jobs and you, you can't find anything because because of the current uh, situation. I mean, you can continue with education or, um, you know, potentially just find other ways um, that, that may, you know, give you life experience and so on as well. And then you can still go back into the corporate, uh, you know, trajectory because in the end we'll be in it for, <laughs> I don't know, 50 years anyway. <laughs> so. No, it's, it's fair, it's fair. And developing on that point, Anna, what would be the main points students must pay attention uh, to when applying and entering the APEC job market? Meaning, okay, with the current global situation, maybe, of course, there's some, some challenges that come alongside, but as well, usually, what would be the main key points that students must pay attention when applying uh, and entering the job market? Um, that's a very good question. I, I think I'd like to be a bit more positive and look at the, this as a, as a positive thing, a the brighter side of the change that is happening because every change brings the negative side and has also the positive side. As yes, it's, uh, the economy is uh, going through really tough times at the moment, but it's going to bring more, uh, uh, more change in, 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 in a way that more like a positive impact on the business because we're, we're going to need 
see that the companies are being more and more digital, like in this uh, case of law, law firms, for example. I, I used to work with law firms and um, law firms were, some law firms were moving from office to office to store more paper. So we're going to have less of that because the economy will demand them to, uh, to, to make the shift and move into the digital uh, area. Right. So, and when you're looking to, for jobs in, in in Asia Pacific, of course, I would first of all pay attention into uh, the market, the the needs of the market. What are the industries that are developed, or for the, that are that are also aligned with your interests? Uh, always, it has to be aligned with your interests, right? Um, and look at a more. Uh, Tech, te technology related skills that you can bring to the company because uh, this is something um, that with this change, this is something that we'll see more and more demand for because people who don't know how to go into digital world that they will need uh, people like uh, new graduates from STEM for culturally um, uh, astute, but also have um, lots of good um, skills and uh, knowledge that will contribute to, to their to their next stage of growth. So don't be scared of this uh, current situation. It's going to be a bit challenging in the beginning, but in the long run, it's going to create a lot more opportunities for you. Um, so look out for the for those uh, in the market. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to. Um, and Anna, what's for you different, for example, when you wrote your your cover letter or your CV or your resume? You you had to add, like adjusted to Asia Pacific countries and companies it was different did you face some some differences you notice some differences there mm -hmm. that that's a very very good question uh, I think Daniel it really depends what kind of companies you're looking for to apply to if you're looking for MNCs then yes you might need to adjust your resumes for uh, for a um, for the Asia Pacific stand standards or the way uh, is appropriate for for them. Uh, but if you're looking for, um, you know, working for smaller size companies, startups that which we have a, a huge community of startups in um, so in APA, uh, for those, I think connections are more important. So uh, in my all entire career, I've always found jobs through people uh, who have referred me to other people or connected me to others. Um, so I really believe in making uh, connections and um, building relationships is the core to success in Asia Pacific. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm taking a question that we received on our question box, Shreya, this is for you. Uh, and it goes along the, the same uh, discussion line of, of the skills needed to enter uh, Asia Pacific countries. And so the question says, is it difficult to learn Chinese Cantonese to study in HKUST? Uh, and also like, uh, if, 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 how was it for you? Uh, sorry, so the question is, it's difficult to learn Chinese and Cantonese? Yes, to study in HKUST. This is a question we received from Neil. Okay, so it's how difficult is it to study Chinese and Cantonese, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. And uh, there's a reason why when I had an option to, do, to, to learn Mandarin or to learn Spanish, I chose Spanish. So um, it is not easy and I did not study Mandarin or Cantonese. So I don't think to actually study in HKUST, you need to have uh, the knowledge of that language because I think that's the good part of being a part of the SEMS community and a SEMS program that despite being in Hong Kong, a uh, majority of my peers and my classmates were actually from Europe and other corners of the world. And about 10 to 15 percent were actually Chinese. And that was great exposure to all kinds of cultures. But I would say that if you're searching for a career in Hong Kong, if you want to um, be a part of consulting or front-end roles, Cantonese isn't as important as Mandarin is because eventually a lot of these consultancies, based on what I've heard and understood from the, of, the, of the industry is, a lot of these uh, consultancies deal and depend a lot on Chinese, the Chinese market and the, uh, the clients in, in China. So Hong Kong is very, very dependent in terms of um, Chinese uh, clientele base. So if you're really keen to work in Hong Kong, um, Chinese or Mandarin would be a good start. However, if you want to study, I do not think it's essential to know either of the languages. It's good to know. It's, it's great to adapt to the cultures and learn a few words, but it, because English is a barrier over there sometimes. But um, at the same time, it's not necessary. Wonderful. So you can live completely fine with English. <laughs> yes. 
Wonderful. I managed. Incredible. Julian, and here we have received a question for you. What is the most useful skill to have to work in consulting? And that will be helpful for his next internship. So a good piece of advice before starting the internship. Sure. The so the, the standard answer would be strategic thinking and prob analytical um, and problem solving skills. <laughs> Um, what that means in reality is, I guess, that um, you perceive a problem, um, a case, a project, a company wanting something, and you have to understand it. You have to understand the situation after you define the prob problem and find an approach how you can, you know, solve the problem, how you can help the, cl the client, how you can, you know, achieve the outcome that you want to achieve. Um, normally you do um, an analysis at the beginning of the current state and um, you could develop a future state, you can give recommendations, etc. So what that means in terms of your skill set, again, like this analytical thinking that you can um, identify problems and develop them well. Apart from that, I think it's very important to be good um, at working in teams um, to have good communication skills, um, to communicate succinctly, meaning um, that you can distill complicated topics to, you know, easily, lightly digestible messages. And um, overall, I think an enthusiasm to, um, to get deep into new topics and potentially industries that you wouldn't have dreamed of doing some work in. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will start now to close our panel discussion. So if you have any more questions, please drop them all before we close on our question box. Uh, and before we start closing, we receive here one question for all of you. It's a very, very short answer question. Can you all share a memorable experience or time that you had at SEMS that was surprisingly helpful? Anna, why don't we start with you? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I think uh, something that um, perhaps not really experienced, but I was, um, when I was doing my exchange at Asada Business School, I was taking this course on strategic thinking and, uh, and scenario thinking approach for businesses, right? So when I was taking that course, I was like, why, I was thinking to myself, why did I even enroll into this course? Because this is something that I will never ever need to do because I'm not gonna work for a company like uh, that it's as big as World Bank. It's not in my, uh, in my plans or it's not like Shell, that a huge company. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I will never use this, but uh, fast forward many years, I actually got to use that in uh, some of my, um, 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 you know, um, some of my, um, uh, in, in some of my roles uh, in different companies. And that's always, I think, I look back and see, see that everything that I've learned from Sense was so, so had such big impact and was really helpful that at the time I didn't really realize when I was studying. <laughs> Wonderful. Shreya, what about you? Any fun, memorable experiences? I think Sense has been, um, uh, there have been a lot of memorable experiences in SEMS, but if I have to think of something that's surprisingly helpful, I don't think it's a surprising fact, but I would say that SEMS really opens you up to meeting, being, uh, talking, as well as networking with a lot of different cultures. And um, I don't think we understand the value of what SEMS gives us until unless we step out into a world or into another culture, which is very different from what we're used to. So I think that is, it's not like a fun fact per se, but it's something that's been really useful. And that is that SEMS opens you up to different cultures, networking, and that really helps going forward in any other industry you work in, or if you're actually trying to move from maybe Europe to actually Asia Pacific. So you already have a network of maybe Chinese friends, Indian friends, et cetera. And it's really easy to then build your community over there and start off your career as well. So that's really helpful. Perfect. Perfect, thank you. And I think for the current cohort, uh, the 
but the most memorable experience will be for sure the online classes. <laughs> I think everyone is now with shifted, she has shifted to online classes. So, um, Julian, here's a question for you that we received. Sure. Was it difficult to move from Europe to Australia? And did you find hard to enter the job market? Um, first question, no, it was not hard. Um, it was rather easy. Um, I did it as a student. I um, went back to Europe and then moved back for work. Um, moving as a student was easy. Moving for work um, is mostly dependent on getting the right visa, which is a whole panel discussion for itself. <laughs> and, and, here it so. says, sorry, and sorry to interrupt you because we just received a question that is exactly that. Do you have tips uh, for a company to sponsor your visa? Um, my story was that I started working in consulting in Germany and despite of having applied for the same position as a graduate without having had work experience in Australia and not having gotten that position, then with the work experience that I got from Europe, having moved back, I got the role. So what it, that means is it's quite arbitrary because I just worked in Europe for half a year and then I got sponsored. So it's, I guess, being at the right um, place at the right time. And like any useful tip would probably be if you want to come to Australia to be aware of the skills visa list that it would make sense to, you know, sell your story along the lines of that and potentially look up what you could do if you want to get here. But I would also say, don't, um, don't give up your ambition or your goals and your dreams of what you want to do for the sake of being here, because there's so many, you know, backpackers and um, work and holiday kind of people who, um, you know, who may be on a journey, but if it's a permanent um, position, um, you know, you, you, you're trying to, you know, establish yourself, you can very much better do that with a work visa or a permanent visa in, in another country. Okay, very, very interesting. So to everyone, be on the right time and right place. <laughs> yeah. Anna and Shreya, it's Malaysia and Singapore are very different countries. So what do you enjoy the most about living in your respective countries uh, in Asia? And Anna, shall we start with you? Like, very, like a short answer, maybe. Mm, I like how, how convenient it is to live in Singapore. It's very organized, very structured, very clean. There is always like a good communication from uh, all the uh, all the agencies that you need to deal with. So it's very easy to do your taxes. It's very easy to order food. So there is a really good infrastructure and it's very, very clean. Um, you, we also have a strong uh, community of uh, SEMSIs in Singapore. So that makes uh, Singapore as home because you always have someone to, to go out or have a drink with or have a chat with when you're having some um, you have some questions regarding your career or um, a work related. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's what I enjoy about Singapore. Nice, nice. And what about you, Shreya, in Malaysia? Um, so Malaysia, actually, the thing I enjoy the most is the cost of living. It's really low, guys. <laughs> so trust me, when it comes to tourism or when it comes to settling down in Malaysia, it's actually not difficult at all um, with, in comparison to other countries, right? Malaysia, in a way, is um, not as developed as Singapore. But at the same time, it's more than more developed than maybe Indonesia, Vietnam, and other countries. So if you're looking to actually visit Malaysia, it's a pretty fun place and very laid back. So it's that kind of a culture. So it's it's nice. It's it's more relaxing, I would say, and it's pretty easy to live. So it, it's work hard, party harder sorts. Okay, thank you very much. Before we close, and we're gonna wrap up everything right now in one or two or three words max. How has Sam's shaped your path? Julian. Um, it, the first thing you come, it comes to your yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say wanderlust as an exploration, um, passion for continuous learning, and hungry to, for new experiences with people from all over the world. That I learned at SEMS and I kept that with me 
on my journey. Good. Uh, Anna, what about you? I think um, STEM's opened a world of opportunities for me and uh, opened up the world for me to, to really see how big it is and how many opportunities are out there. Um, STEM's helped me to be more curious and that's something that I still um, use it um, in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and also great, gave me the, the SEMS community that um, I can find friends in all the countries that I, I visit. <laughs> and Shreya? I think similar to Anna, actually, friend, SEMS ends up giving you an, another family. And I really mean that because the kind of friends you make all across the world, it, there's nothing like it. I, it. You build connections, but it really, um, the connections you make through SEMS actually somehow stay for lifelong, which is great. And I think another thing that Sam's really helps in is opening, it, it gives you a very different perspective of things and opens your mind up to different opportunities or different kinds of thinking and people that you never thought of before. So I think it makes you a very, very different person and more open-minded in nature. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Julian, we just received some last questions. I'm trying to sure. address everything. And here it says, okay, we have here two question that I think you can answer uh, simultaneously because the first one is is the recruitment really different from Europe uh, since you have work in, in Europe as well that would be very interesting if you can address uh, if, it, if, if it's really different and if you can give some tips on consulting uh, books or a short course that you may might uh, took in the past maybe to prepare for, for consulting interviews no, I would not say that recruiting is different. Um, I would say it still depends on which which uni you go to and um, what you've been studying. But be aware that if you're in Australia or if, sorry, if, you, if you're not in Australia or if you're not an Australian citizen, it's very hard to find, to lend a graduate role in, in Australia. So I would say Australia makes sense from a career perspective with some work experience to make it yourself a bit easier and in terms of getting into consulting um in terms of prep, prep preparation i would say and that's based on my previous experience there are some books but i wouldn't recommend a particular book um just because <laughs> that was uh, like seven years ago eight years ago and in internships even more that i practiced for it so i'm sure there are more books and they're probably all digital now not anymore on paper <laughs> But I would say it's great to, to practice with friends and to do some case studies. So do that a lot. Familiarize yourself with the structure of it um, based on what you learn in uni, what you can find online. Use any material that a consultancy you're interviewing for is giving you. Practice with friends as in a real interview situation. And then you can give each other feedback. And ideally practice with people who have already done it, um, as in maybe some, you know, students who have, uh, who have already did, done an internship so they can help you. And then it's a great win-win situation for everyone. Wonderful, thank you. If you have any, any of you, like all the attendees have more questions, feel free to send us the questions via email to apacfair at sems.org, apacfair at sems.org. And we can then forward those questions to the to Anna, Shreya, or Julian. I'm sure they will be happy to to answer all further questions that might that anyone might have in the future. For now, that's all. Anna, Julian, and Shreya, thank you very much for participating and answering our questions. We know your your time is super valuable uh, now more than ever. So thank you once again. It, it has very it has been very interesting to hear from your broad experiences and in different perspectives and countries. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and I wish you all stay safe and wherever you're currently located. And thank you once again to the, to the student board and SEMS Global Office to, to organizing this. Uh, if you want to, to say goodbye, Anna, Julian and Shreya on that, uh, you, you feel free to do it right now, Anna. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Daniel for organizing this and for, thanks for everyone for um, joining the, the, the panel. Hope you, um, you had a good, uh, you had a good understanding of what's, what are some of the challenges that are in APAC. If you have any specific questions, feel free to send me uh, on link, uh, you can send, send it on, uh, send it to Daniel and I'll uh, 
be sure to get back to you on a timely manner. Oh, yeah, um, nice thanks, well. everyone. Well, thank you very much. Monshray, as well, you as well. Uh, okay, on a parting note, thanks so much, Daniel, for organizing this, and thanks to the entire uh, alumni team as well. Um, thank you guys for attending this. As everyone mentioned as well, any questions you have, any doubts, or any queries or clarifications, feel free to send it to Daniel, and we're happy to help you in any way possible. And all the very best for the future prospects and your career path. Hope to meet you all in Asia soon and some part of the world. For sure, for sure. So have a good good morning, Americas and Europe, and good afternoon, good night, Asia. Uh, uh, until next time. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye, guys.